Hi. Oh, hi. Let me try this microphone because I may need to yell a bit later. <coughs> la 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 la. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today. What a nice weather today, right? Full of sunshine. Okay. And today, I will talk about dear developers, you are awesome. And I'm Lily. Nice to meet you. I'm an engineer at the Lego group. So they call me an engineer, but basically, I'm also a developer. Okay. Before we start, I wonder if you have heard of the phrase, everything is awesome. But in case you haven't, I have prepared a little media for you. Everything is awesome. Everything is cool where you're part of the team. Everything is awesome. La 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 dream. Okay. That's it. I don't know why the video doesn't play, but you heard it at least, so that's good enough. And everything is awesome. So including everything that developers make. And who make awesome stuff? Of course, there will be awesome people. So awesome people make awesome stuff. Therefore, developers are awesome. So a little question here. Please raise your hand if you think you're awesome. I see a lot of hands, but it's okay if some hands are not raised. I just assume you are humble. That's good. But please keep in your heart that you are awesome. Okay, so why do I have to emphasize that? I have been saying everyone is awesome, developers are awesome. But why do I have to say that again and again? It's because I want you to also remember, please don't be stressed whenever you feel that, mm, I'm kind of stuck. There are some things that I don't know. I need to learn a lot more in order to be able to deliver. Um, so please don't be stressed when it happens, because there is much more than just delivering stuff as a developer. So the agenda for my speech today is to start with a little bit about myself and then three main points that I want to bring to you, which are to overcome unknowns, honey and bees, and communication, the things that I think makes the developer awesome. So let me start with something about myself. And since we are in Denmark, I will try a bit of Danish. I took some Danish class, so hope I'm okay. Yeah, Lily, my name is Lily. I live in Billund with my dog, Teddy. I'm 25 years old. I come from Hong Kong. I come from Hong Kong. I'm an engineer. And I'm for the Lego group. I work for the Lego group. <sighs> Great. But seriously, what have I been working on? What am I doing, basically? So I think it all started when I was about 13 years old at school in a computer class where we have to do visual basic to call a little bit of game, like if this, then that, else, blah, 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 and then add some buttons, images to create a little game. I think that's really cool, and I enjoy doing that. Meanwhile, a lot of my classmates have no idea what's going on with the programs. So I think, hmm, there's probably something in me that I understand the program, and I should continue working towards this direction. And so I did. I did computer science in university, where I made this game called Mancala. It is an African chess game. Basically, you play against a player, and then there are a lot of different little dots where you need to move them around. And then at the end, whoever accumulates more dots wins. So I created such a game. And the interesting part here is that you are playing against an AI agent who um, has no idea how to play it at first. So you will play against a newbie, but then eventually the AI agent will learn from you. So you can actually see the AI agent improve while you are playing with the, in the game, which is pretty interesting. That's what I did in university. And then I started my job. Um, the first job is 
something about DevOps, where people manage uh, access to different tools like GitHub, Jira, Bitbucket, and also some pipeline templates such that other teams can also use them. So as I mentioned, they need to manage access to different tools. And then back in that time, a lot of people are like, mm, I want access to GitHub. They do it manually, and then the team members of my team have to go and give them access manually. So my other friend and colleague and I have an idea that, hmm, let's just create a little chatbot on Slack such that they can have a standardized process to create a support request, like fill in their name, their email, blah, blah, blah. And then they will create um, a support request will be created automatically with a link saying, thank you for your request. Here's your request number, and here's the link. And my team actually like it so much, and they see a lot of potential in that project. So they added a lot more um, features to the bot. For example, an automation that would be triggered to grant people access to GitHub directly. So the process will be like, OK, I want access to GitHub. And then the bot will be triggered uh, to trigger the automation that will give them access to GitHub. And since we have done that kind of automation, of course, we have to present them to users. So I did a lot of presentations, and I put a picture of Teddy here because I think everybody loves Teddy. <laughs> He's super cute. And also made some educational videos as well because um, another team I was in was about managing um, a team's infrastructure and instances. And that platform has a lot of features, but not everyone in the company knows how to utilize those features. So since they see me doing a lot of presentations with Teddy and awesome stuff, they're like, hey, Lily, please join me to make these educational videos. And so I did. And I put a little icon here as a chef. The reason I chose it is because she is holding a whisk. So there was a period of time where I tried to be a scrum master. Um, and one of the challenges there is that people love talking so much in the meetings. So I brought a spatula from my kitchen because I haven't been using it for years. <laughs> and then I was like, OK, now whoever wants to talk, please hold this spatula. And so I think there are some orders in that, which is nice. The speaking want. But OK, I think I've done a lot of awesome stuff there. But what people think I'm actually doing? My sister thinks that I've been working from days to night, from Monday to Sunday. I have no idea why, because I actually go out sometimes. But that's her impression on me. And then my friends, of course, think I can hack into their social accounts, the typical stuff, which I can't. I, I really can't. OK. And my parents think I can fix everything at home, like printers, TVs, the phone, and so on, the Wi-Fi, everything. And of course, playing a lot of Lego bricks. Since I'm now working for the Lego group, there are Lego bricks everywhere. And therefore, it makes sense for me to be playing Lego bricks all the time, which kind of makes sense. But that's not what I only do. And of course, people think I'm good at debugging and finding bugs. And there are times when something didn't work for them. And then so they have to call me. But then it worked miraculously. So maybe there is some. Aurora in me, I don't know. So yes, I'm a developer. I am awesome, right? Even when somehow everywhere is on fire, I think that mm, this is fine. I'm still awesome. Yeah, everything is awesome. I just need to sing this and tell myself that I'm awesome. I'm awesome. It's on fire, but this is fine. But is this really true? Does it make sense? Because if I'm really good, if I'm really awesome, there should be no fire at the first place, right? If there is fire, it means that probably I did something wrong which causes the fire, isn't it? So why? To give you more context, I need to go back in time. So once upon a time, I have a task where I had to migrate some source code from Azure DevOps to GitHub. And then the challenge here is to rewrite the CI-CD pipelines, the YAML files, because the syntax of the pipelines on Azure DevOps is actually different than those on GitHub. 
And then the situation there is that we have a monorepo with about 15 microservices. I can't remember, but it is a huge number of microservices. Although the lucky part is that most of them are of the same type, so they are actually just reusing the same kind of pipeline script to build, to deploy, and to test. Although some of them are of different kind, like maybe they are not backend, maybe they are front end or open API, and some of them may be owned by other teams, so they have their own kind of pipeline process. But I don't care because I think, ah, oh, this is so cool, so awesome. Imagine being able to migrate pipelines for all these microservices. It would be so cool. It would sound so cool to me. So I was thinking, hmm. I've created some GitHub workflows before. I know what those pipelines do. And the main pipelines are actually already um, translated by my colleagues. So I was thinking, OK, I can just reuse them, and then reuse and reuse, and then there's nothing much I should do. So OK, I think I can do this. <sighs> mm, I have been spending weeks months trying to work on this, thinking, mm, I can do this, I can do this, there is progress, it's fine. And then people start thinking, saying, asking like, oh, how's it going, Lily? When is it ready? C can we migrate it now? Or do you need any help? So I was thinking, mm, I've been working on this for weeks or even months already. So there is already a lot of scripts that I have made or logic. They are quite complex. So it may be more time consuming if my team have to actually understand and learn my, what I've done and then uh, kind of hand over and then I have to distribute uh, some tasks to them, blah, blah, blah. I was thinking, hmm, maybe it takes too much time. So it's OK. I'll just continue working on it. It's fine. So eventually, I managed to still do it. Uh, I still achieved the migration. But I was so tired because, as I mentioned, I've been spending days, weeks, or even months on that task. So I've been thinking about it when I wake up, and then when I eat, when I take a shower, when I go to a walk with Teddy, even when I dream, which is sometimes convenient because I find some bugs when I'm dreaming, and then when I wake up, it actually exists. But I don't think it's healthy. The point is, I'm so tired. I will start thinking, ah, what am I doing with my life, just writing pipelines? Ah. It's okay, because it was Christmas time then. <laughs> so I'll just go on holiday. And this is a picture that I took in the Lake District. It is a place very close to Scotland, but not in Scotland. It's full of lakes, as the name mentioned. And it's so beautiful. Look at the sunset and the fogs oh, and the landscape. It's just so beautiful and quiet as well, because there is no, ma no many cars or planes. It's just so quiet with all the mosses and grass on the floor act like a natural noise cancellation thing. It's super quiet. And with the water, the cave, ah, it's just so cool. And I tried to climb, although I didn't reach the top because it was too scary. The cliff is right next to me. I'm not used to that, but I tried. And the point is, I finally understand why people say they love the nature so much. It really is very amazing with the um, atmosphere, the air. The air is so clean, the quality, the water is sweet. And then I was like, what am I doing with my life? Just hiding in my room for weeks and months to write pipeline scripts while there is a lot more in the world to explore. And now I have muscle pain and neck pain. I don't want to do anything anymore. So what's the point? What did I do wrong? I thought I've been working so hard already, but why do I feel so empty? So I've been reflecting on myself, and I think, hmm, there is more than delivery. There are more that developers are working so hard to improve on that are not just about delivering the, the projects and solutions. And I think they are, in general, of personal and interpersonal skills. Personal skills, as in something like playing the piano, you know, it's actually pretty hard to play a key that sounds quiet because you have to press it all the way down to the bottom, but still you can't press it too quickly because otherwise it will sound loud. But if you press it 
too softly, then it won't make a sound. So it is pretty hard. There are some skills there, just like programming. It's not that easy. But OK, assume you have practiced that. You are good at playing the piano. Then you need to join the band. You need to play the music with some other people, just like doing programming. As a developer, you work as a team usually. So how do you play with a band? You probably need to listen to them playing the music or give them some signals and winkings, like, oh, I will take this part, and so on. So how do you collaborate with other people? I think that is the thing that makes de developers truly awesome, because they're working so hard on these. So the three points, I'm going to talk more about the three points now. The first one is about overcoming unknowns. And what do I mean by overcoming unknowns? I will start with a story reference from a, another story called Silly Guy Trying to Move a Mountain. In Chinese, it's called Yu Gong Yi San. What it means basically is imagine a huge mountain of unknowns, and it's on my way. So the silly lily is like, ah, let me move it away. It's blocking me. And then when other people hear that, they're like, ah, oh, she's silly. <laughs> it's not possible. But I don't care. I think that mm, I'll just do it step by step. I believe it's possible. So I did. I go <laughs> and remove the mountain bit by bit. And at the end, I succeeded. So the moral of the story is that you can just take baby steps, step by step. It may look scary and huge, but at the end, if you take baby steps, step by step, you can still be able to do it. So an example in real life, um, let's talk about tax. I have no idea what it is. And uh, no, I have some ideas now. Uh, but back in that time, uh, I didn't have enough experience on what tax is. And then my father, he was uh, still living in Hong Kong, but then he has some properties in the UK, and then somehow he received some fines saying that he didn't pay tax for the income from those properties. And then he was like, I'm so confused, because I actually did pay, there are bank transactions, so why do I still receive some penalties? And then there are also a lot of letters that he received from the tax offices, like, oh, you haven't paid for a month now, so you now have a penalty of 100 pounds. And then the next month, it will be like, oh, we still haven't received your payment, so it will be 200 pounds now. And they just keep accumulating and accumulating. It's pretty stressful for my dad. And then also there are a lot of rules and regulations as well, like, if your income does not exceed 200 pounds, then you don't need to pay, but if it exceeds, 300 pounds, then you need to pay 5%, blah, blah, blah. It's so confusing. So it's like the huge mountain of unknowns, like, oh, what's going on? What's happening? And then I don't want to see my dad that frustrated, so I offered to give some help. So I collected the documents, the letters, and the rules, and the text, and I was like, okay, where should I start? I have no idea what these are, but it's okay, I'll just try to read them one by one, letter by letter, rules by rules, and try to see how it matches the tax situation that my dad has. So I did, and finally, I figured out that it's actually just, um, he missed to put in a reference code when he do the bank transaction. So he did pay, but the, pay, uh, but the tax officer thinks that he didn't pay, uh, because there is no reference code to know that, oh, it is actually coming from my father. So, like this. And I wrote the letter to the tax office because they think we are from overseas, so we can't call them. Um, we are still waiting for their reply, but at least from our end, <laughs> the solution is clear and the issue is clear. So maybe my sister was right when she thinks that I've been working from days to nights. I may not be working, but somehow I look like I'm working on silly stuff like this instead of going out and have a drink. 
But the point I want to bring here is that I think coding is a lot like that. You may actually receive a piece of code, maybe it may be a legacy code, a monorepo, or even a huge chunk of spaghetti code from your colleagues uh, because he or she needs to rush through a deadline and then you have to take over the piece of code. So it may look like a huge block of mess which you have no idea what's going on, but still you can read the guides the code, line by line, step by step, the best practices, and then eventually you can still find a solution and do what you want to do. And I think the reason developers can do this is because instead of saying things like, ah, oh, I haven't learned this before, so I don't know how to do it, or ah, oh, I'm not an op person, I don't do operations, or it's just too much, this huge chunk of spaghetti code how am I supposed to work on it? Or nobody told me what it is. Nobody told me how to apply for a service account or from Azure. Or I'm not a designer. I don't do UI stuff. The buttons, ah, I, it's not my thing. So instead of saying things like that, I think developers are actually pretty proactive that if there is something they don't know, they'll just go and learn it. If there is something that it seems missing, they just go and Google it or search from Confluence. And then in case they really don't want to do something, it will be because they don't want to. It's not because uh, I don't know how to do it or uh, I'm not this kind of person. It's because they choose not to do it. It is in their own control. So I think developers are really good at expanding their code of influence instead of letting their environments control who they are and what they can do. Isn't that awesome? So next time, this is just an opportunity for me to show off what I ate in Italy. Uh, in case you see more spaghetti code, remember the huge mountain of unknowns. You can still eat them bit by bit, and then eventually you can finish them. So why are developers awesome? Because developers work hard to be brave. You need to be brave to be able to overcome the huge mountain of unknowns. And you need to be brave to take initiative and be proactive to be the first person and the pioneer. So it takes time, but it's OK. Remember that you are doing good, even though you are spending so much time on it. So that's it for the first point. And then the second point, honey and bees. Isn't Teddy very cute? Oh, <laughs> okay. So honey and bees, what do I mean with honey and bees? Once upon a time, there was a kingdom with a queen. The queen doesn't like bees because she thinks that oh, the bees are so annoying, la la la, wah, 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 so noisy. So she told the people, can you please remove all the bees in this kingdom? Thank you very much. And then the people are like, okay, uh, we will just do whatever you want because you're the queen, we just want you to be happy. And so they did, and the queen is indeed happy. And then after a while, the queen is like, hmm, I'm missing some honey, the sweetness. Where are they now? I haven't seen them for quite a while. And then the people are like, oh, but you told us to kill the bees. Now there's no honey because Bees make honey, and without bees, there's no more honey. And then the queen is like, what? No more honeys? Ah! So the moral of the story is that please keep a balance with the bees and honey. Although honey may seem attractive, you can't ignore the bees. In this scenario, in our scenario, the bees are work that are like knowledge transfer, refactoring your code, or do planning sessions, the kind of work that is important but are not really visible to customers. They have no idea that you refactored the code. And then Honey, in our scenario, is like, mm, let's do some automation on this. Let's make a magic button that will do everything at once in just one click. Or let's put AI. Everybody loves AI. Right. So sweet like honey. But all of them consume time. 
and time is limited. So how do we find a balance between the bees and the honey? It is pretty tricky because, as I mentioned previously in the first point, we need to unblock a huge mountain of unknowns, and that takes time. So that huge mountain of unknowns may be like the bee stuff. But then at the same time, we need to be able to deliver the honey stuff as well, because otherwise customers will not be happy, and then it may, we may be exported. Okay. And an example on how to balance the honey and bee is uh, remember the example where I needed to migrate the source code from Azure DevOps to GitHub? I was thinking that, hmm, I've created GitHub workflows before, and then, so that was a few years ago, so there weren't reusable workflow back then. So I was like, hmm, there's no reusable workflow, so let me just create a pipeline that will automatically create the workflow for each microservice. So <laughs> I used Jinja2 template to create a template for the workflow pip pipeline script. Um, and then I created a GitHub action that will consume this template to auto-generate a workflow file for each of the microservices. It sounds so cool and awesome because I don't need to copy and paste that many times. As a developer, we should not repeat ourselves. So, yeah. 15 microservices. They are actually like the B kind of tasks because customers don't, can't really see what you're doing, but they are something needed. And then after about a week or two, GitHub announced that they have reusable workflows now. <laughs> so although my team members are like, oh, you are still awesome because you are faster than GitHub, but that's not the point. The point is, my effort probably all go wasted. Although the story here, I should probably pay more attention to their roadmap. But the point is, instead of thinking I can do this, I should probably split the task into smaller pieces to let my team member participate and join. Why? Because it can actually improve the team capability. Um, the reason I did it by myself is because the majority of my team do not have experience writing those pipeline uh, files. So instead of doing it all by myself, I should actually plan something for the team to contribute as well so we improve as a team, such that it won't be like, oh, when I go, when I left the team, then when, if something went wrong, then uh, they probably need to spend a lot of time resolving the technical doubt to learn how does it work exactly. And of course, I will be less stressed because if I delegate my work to my colleagues, then I will have less workload and more people can be able to take the responsibility, share responsibility. If something went wrong, it won't be my, my only fault. So everyone will be happy. Instead of being wanting to deliver the, the migration as soon as possible, I should actually rather put more time to think, mm, how can I delegate it to my team to distribute the workload such that if or someday I said, mm, I want to create a, t a template, then maybe some other team members will be interested enough to say, oh, but I actually see a reusable workflow from GitHub, so maybe you don't have to do it. So things like this. So, why are developers amazing? Because developers work so hard to be focused. At the same time, although we are focused, we also need to make sure we find the balance. So, not only working so hard on the technical stuff, but also finding the balance to be able to deliver. Although, as a side note, please don't be too greedy as well, because we only have 24 hours a day. So. Of course, it may be possible to deliver both the honey and the bees, but you only have 24 hours a day. And with developers working at home that much, it, at least for me, I pretty much enjoy working from home. But then it will be so difficult to separate work life and your private life. And then if you are so into the, the mountain of unknowns, don't be too greedy because you also need to do something else as a person, like go out, have a drink, have a walk, and so on. Find the balance. Hmm. 
the third point about communication. So, why is communication important? What, is it, what does it have to do with developers? Because I think people come and go, like in this in IT industry, I think that a lot of people actually come and go in like a year or two years time. So there is a lot of handover tasks and knowledge transfer needed to do so. And customer needs, we need to make sure that we know what does our customers want. What do they want? Am I doing what they want? So that kind of communication is very much needed. And of course, collaboration, because we work as a team. Something that you think, that you, some amazing stuff you have in your mind, you need to also be able to express it out. Otherwise, no one knows what you're thinking. So yeah, as I've mentioned, you need to express your abstract thoughts and also to listen to customers and your team members, two things. Let me put more details into each of them and I will start with the express part. So I mentioned that, okay, let me split the task into smaller stories and make other people join me. So in order to do that, I think I need to write some guides or create some videos, demo videos. Why? Because imagine this to be me. And then some random guy thinks that, ah, oh, I think you did an awesome job. I want to contribute. So I'm like, ah, oh, thank you. OK, you can just do A, B, C, one, two, three, step A, B, C, and then you can do it. And then, oh, OK, and off to work. Nice, one contributor. And then the next contributor, ah, oh, I think you did an awesome job. I would like to contribute. So I repeat the same thing. Oh, OK, you just need to do A, B, C, one, two, three, do this and that, and then you can do it. And then, ah, oh, OK, and off to work. And more people want to come and contribute. Like, ah, I think you did an awesome job. I would like to contribute. And I'm like, ah, OK, you can do A, B, C, one, two, three. Talk to this person and that person, and then you can do it. Ah, oh, OK. And off to work. Ah, I have so many contributors in my project. So nice, right? No, it's not nice. Don't repeat yourself. You have been repeating the same thing again and again. So. That doesn't feel satisfying. Instead, imagine if you have written some tutorials and guides and video demos, and then whoever wants to come and contribute, they can just read them or see them. And then they'll be like, ah, oh, so that's how I can contribute without actually having to uh, like find me and talk and arrange a meeting. They can just go and see the guys at their own time. And this is more scalable, because if there are more people in the future who want to contribute as well, they'll be able to just read the guides and then contribute. And that means everyone is happy. They can do what they want, and I don't need to repeat myself. <laughs> and the example I just mentioned is about contributing to a project. But that is not the only thing that developers need to do. Developers also need to write tutorials to teach other people, for example, users, how to use their solutions. And then explanations, explaining how does the code work, uh, what is the architecture, how is there any dependency with other teams, what does different terminology mean. So a lot of different things for different kind of stakeholders and audiences. Developers have to write different kind of documentations for all these kind of people. So as simple as writing something like a recipe, like you just need to add some flour, 500 grams, and some sugar, and then mix them together, put in the oven, done. Or as complicated as something like a laboratory report, like, oh, uh, the methodology is that we try this and that, and then we compare this method and that method, and our observation is blah, 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 because some theories, blah, blah. So much details. So be a to be able to write from as simple as a recipe to as complex as a laboratory report, I think it's not easy. Developers are actually working so hard to make sure that others can follow their minds, their abstract minds, because there are times when developers may be writing something uh, too complicated, 
And maybe the users think that, mm, I actually don't need to know it. I just need to know the steps that I need to make it work on my machine. So considerations like this, I think, make writing these kind of documents uh, much more difficult. And developers are working so hard to be good at it. Aren't they awesome? And then about listening. So listening, I think there are listening users. We need to listen to users. And teammates, we also need to listen to our teammates. Why? Let me start with why do we need to listen to our users. As you can see, here is a browser. You probably have no idea what it's doing. Neither do our users. They are also so confused when they see it like, oh, Mm, okay, so I can see amazing product. What is a product? And then if I click on a name, it will open a side panel. Okay, assign access to Lily, and then Jira, GitHub, buttons. What is it? So users are like, I have no idea what it is. We did some user research, and they have no idea what we want to bring to them. So some common questions would be like, what is a product? Where are they? people under a product, and then is there a link to a group? I see some group uh, name or ID here. What is that? Can Lily only see these Jira projects? Or can she actually also go and use those projects? Or who owns these repositories? Are they owned by Lily or by a product or by someone else? So a lot of confusion here. And our team learns that we should actually uh, develop a continuous feedback loop, of course, to continuously listen to customers, uh, also demo to them to let them know that oh, you can use it by blah, blah, blah. So the key point here is that developers are working so hard to make sure that users love and can use their solutions. And that is not easy. And then in terms of teammates, what do I mean to listen to teammates? So just now, the example is to give people access to something like GitHub, for example. Imagine a user saying, hmm, uh, a teammate, sorry. A teammate saying, users should not get access to GitHub if they don't own a repository. Why? Because if the user does not own a repository, maybe that means the user is not coding. And if the user is not coding, then maybe the user is not using GitHub. And then the other team is like, but how about new joiners then? The new joiner has just joined the team, so of course the new joiner don't have a repository. So how would they have access to GitHub then? And then maybe like, oh, then maybe they should create just a blank repository to get started. But then in order to create a blank repository before they have access to GitHub, maybe we need some automation to be done from our side to help them create the repository before they get access. So, okay, maybe we can have such kind of feature, but, but then how much longer would it take to deliver it then? Back to the honey and bee scenario, the balance, how do you find the balance? So there are a lot of discussions like this, and imagine having this kind of discussion at home or with my friends, I don't think it will end up well they may start having personal attack on me, but it won't happen on a professional scenario. Why? Because I think developers are all very kind, that they all believe that we all come from a good initiative, that um, whatever we say is because we want the best on our solutions and products. And having this kind of trust is so important because it develops a safe environment for everyone in the workplace to be able to have a hard and complex discussions like this. And that is not easy to be able to develop such a um, culture and atmosphere. So, a summary of this third point is developers are working really hard to be curious because developers need to know oh, what are users thinking? Do they understand what I write? What are my teammates thinking? Uh, will they be able to contribute to my work or this and that? They need to be curious to understand what other people are also thinking about. And that is not easy. So a little quote here from the book from The Little Prince. It is only with the heart that one can see clearly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Like when we talk to users or when we want to express stuff. Although there are a lot of words written on piece of papers, but still 
all of us are from all over the world. English is not our first uh, language. A lot of our first language is something else. So sometimes words may not really exp express right, but I think developers are really good to listen and to read with their heart to understand, oh, what do you actually mean? And that is not easy as well. So yeah. I have mentioned the three points that I think make developers awesome. And as a sum up, the first point, I think developers are awesome because they're proactive to, over big, to overcome big unknowns, the mountain of unknowns. They're proactive to, to remove them bit by bit. The second point about striving for a good balance between the honey and the bees, I think it's not easy, just like every, everything else in life, to find a balance is not easy. And then the third point, developers are kind and caring because there is a lot to communicate and we need a safe environment in order to do so. So thinking back at my case, although I felt that I didn't do the great job, I could have done so much better, but that doesn't mean I'm not awesome. I am still awesome. I'm just still learning and improving, just like CI/CD pipelines, you know, incremental deliveries. Although I may not be perfect on all aspects, but we are all aware of the things that we want to work harder on. And isn't that good enough to be awesome, to be conscious about it? So yeah, that's it. And remember, remember to eat. Don't skip meals. Remember to sleep as well. And you can have some fun, of course. Remember to play. And last but not least, remember to spend some time with your family and friends. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you want to find me, feel free to go to LinkedIn and search for Lily Chen. That's it. Mm-hmm.